Hello, hello everyone. I hope you are having an awesome, awesome day. My name is Daniel. I'm a part of the uh, F5 marketing team and we're back again with a very, very exciting event with another startup leader. And this time what we're talking about is goal setting for startups. Before I intro, intro our speaker today, I just want to know where you're all coming in from, right? Um, let us know in the chat. And right now I can see we have people from Kenya, we have people from Poland, we have people from Tijuana, awesome, awesome. Toronto, a lot of people from Toronto. Interestingly, our speaker is also from there. So that should be a lot of fun. New York, uh, we have people from Croatia, Montreal, awesome London, awesome. So what's really awesome about the events that we do and just generally um, the FI network and the startup network in general is you have a very global audience. So it's kind of a you know testament to the power of startups and entrepreneurship. So yeah, uh, let me introduce, introduce um, our speaker today. Uh, Ahmed is the director of Communitech. He's a seasoned, um, seasoned entrepreneurship leader with experience helping startups in Canada, Egypt, and the US. So we're very, very excited to have him with us. Uh, Ahmed, if you could maybe unmute yourself, say hello to the audience. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, great to see everyone. Um, although virtually and uh, again, I'm glad to see lots of folks coming from Toronto and Canada, but I see wonderful presence from all over the globe. Uh, thanks again for having me. Look forward to the webinar and, um, you know, giving you some folks some knowledge around goal setting and, and everything. Uh, and again, wonderful opportunity by the Founder Institutes. The, the global presence is, is amazing. And it's just the learning from that community and the networking with that community that kind of keeps the startup ecosystem going. So thanks again. Looking forward. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. So uh, some uh, housekeeping rules before we begin. Uh, folks, if you could see to your right, you have this Q&A button right under the chat button. So if you have a question for Ahmed, drop your question there. And then once Ahmed is done with his presentation, we'll um, bring your question on screen and then Ahmed can answer whatever that you have in mind. And Please do keep in mind that uh, once we're done with the presentation and the Q&A, we have a networking portion. So if you want to connect with startup founders from across the world, just generally anybody who's enthusiastic about startups, maybe the FI team, and hopefully if Emma has time, he might be sticking around as well. So do, stay, uh, do stick around for yeah the networking part. And just la the last thing, if you look right at the bottom of your screen, you have this reactions button. So if you love what Emma is saying, you know, if you're enjoying uh, the content today, do show him some love. And with that, folks, I will be uh, moving to the back of the stage and letting Emma take over. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate it. So again, let me start the sharing my screen here. Can get some verbal or even in the comment um, chat if uh, everyone can see the screen okay yes wonderful so again um we'll be talking about okrs and goal setting in general uh with the lens on early stage and how can it actually um, support startups in setting their goal delivering on their mission and and hopefully kind of you know progressing in the direction of um of their uh, goals and, and objectives, um, as as um, you know, um, um, customer in these things, we always start with a joke. And uh, but I'm hoping to be more than a joke. Uh, it's uh, you know we have a lot of unsaid and un um, you know documented goals and aspirations and dreams in our mind, especially in the early stage when we're running startup or we're even thinking about it. And unless unless these things are actually documented somehow shared and communicated with the rest of the team and who are we working with um again it will always be in someone's mind and you know there will be always um a difference in expectation whether whether we're actually nailing them or meeting them or anything like that so uh here you go 
this is something I wanted to start with, and and um, and Daniel with the, with helping me with it. Uh, I'm hoping if you can just um, scan the QR code with your mobile phone and give us some insights into where you are on the OKR um, spectrum. Um, um, again, we want to know how familiar you are with it, and I'm going to switch to this um, for a second, um, and I'm hoping you can. Um, here you go. So this, these are the answers that I'm receiving from you. And again, it's live, it goes up and down. So you know how it goes. Uh, I just wanted to know where the, where, where the people are coming from today in terms of familiarity with OKRs. Um, I know I've talked to groups that have no idea what is OKRs, although obviously they've been familiar with goals and goal setting in general. And then some people heard about it, but they haven't actually used it uh, a ton. And some that are familiar and some others that are practitioner that are actually have some experience with it, they use it whether on a, on a team or within an organization or their startup or their community. And there are folks uh, like me and a couple of people on, on our team that are OKR champions, that are people who advocate for it. Um, speaks about it, it's important, try to share the benefits of it with the people and gets the insights from it with, um, you know, with everyone in the organization. I see we have a lot of, you know, a huge spread, uh, but it gives you insight. Again, it's a bell curve, like anything. So we'll try to be as, you know, um, generic as possible so that we can cater to the folks that are not as familiar to it. But at the same time, I'm glad that we have some folks with experience and uh, people that are championing the process that will obviously add to the conversation. I'm hope for it to be um, you know a conversation with you, not just like a one way teaching uh, or or anything like that. So I'm glad uh, we have this um, kind of spread. And I'll um, I'll go back here for a second so that we can continue on. What are we going to cover today? Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, uh, personally and professionally, and then we'll go through a bit of history, hopefully not uh, so boring, but uh, I think it's, it, it's good to have some history and, and background of where, we, uh, where OKR came from. Um, we'll review the framework, obviously we'll get an overview, we'll have some examples, and we'll share the benefits. This is actually how you get people excited about it and invested in it. Um, and we'll talk about different approach, cascading and alignments and all of that. Um, and hopefully I'll take you through a couple of steps on how to write good OKRs because really setting, writing, communicating OKRs is the, um, is the most critical, I would, I would say, part of it. Because if, uh, if you don't get right, you're not measuring the right thing, you're not communicating uh, the right thing, you're not aligning on the rest of the team and what's important to you. And then we'll go through the process or at least a recommended process uh, for you if you plan to um, um, kind of adopt um, an OKR framework. And we'll share a bit of resources and obviously have some questions at the, at the end. So again, I'm Ahmed Bidawi. Um, I'm the director of the data strategy and program management uh, office at Communitech. Uh, I lead the teams that work um, on our data products and initiatives. And at the same time, I do a bit of operational excellence on the program management side. And this is where the OKR lives. I'm coming to you from uh, Toronto today. A wonderful fall weather. Um, again, this is the picture that you usually see when you, you know, you get familiar with the with the with the city, but I'm sure the folks that are from Toronto will tell you we have other you know uh, pictures of it. Uh, sometimes they're full of uh, construction sites and cranes and stuff at the you know moment. But uh, it's a great it's a great city, and uh, I'll um, it's a good segue to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, um, I I lived and studied and worked in in, in so many countries. Uh, I'm born and raised in Cairo. Egypt. I studied in the U.S. in in Boston. When you know, I went there um, to get my uh, grad studies in business, and I wanted to focus on entrepreneurship. I moved to Canada uh, in Toronto ten years ago. I um, I always love a good piece of art, whether it's photography, a painting, or drawing, and and also 
um, any craftsmanship, whether it's uh, wood, leather, uh, it gets me excited. At some point, I was uh, I played squash. I was obsessed with lighthouses when I used to live in in New England and, and Boston. I have a healthy uh, like to it now, but uh, but not as such. Um, uh, my wife is in the in HR, people and culture. If you're um, if you're you know more into that space now. Um, she also appreciates art, and we both have a seven-year-old uh, boy. Uh, I I always like to ask what people are reading these days, and always like a good recommendation. Um, the one that I just finished that's more of a business is The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni. It's a really good book around um, organizational health, team health, um, um, team you know structures and and benefits and uh, and all of that. And then stuff that we do on the side and, you know, readings that we do on the side. I, uh, I like Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, it's a really good book around uh, kind of, you know, getting folks, um, how you understand the challenges um, of life in general. It's, it's a heavy reading, but it's a really good reading. Professionally, the things that you would see on a business card, your LinkedIn, um, my background is computer engineering. Uh, I've done some development in coding in the past. That was more than 20 years ago. You can tell I'm a bit old. I started my first social venture right after university. We wanted to help folks with our skill set to kind of present and articulate their skills and, uh, you know, uh, their abilities differently. So we, we started the first Korean entrepreneurship um organization out of a public university in egypt that was 20 years ago to cater to the stem grads um help them with essential skills what we used to call soft skills in the past and all of that uh been working with founders around startups and scale-ups for the past 15 years i've ran founder support programs at multiple organizations endeavor ocad university here in toronto and recent most recently community tech for the past Three plus years. Um, I led teams um, consisting of less than a five handful of team members. We were in the same place. And I've led teams that are more than 250, 270 people that were distributed all across Ontario, um, as you would obviously imagine during the pandemic. Um, I consider myself an advocate um, for um, especially the founders from diverse backgrounds and mission-driven startups and, and scale-ups. Um, if you're familiar with the framework, the working geniuses, I, I, I like to share that so you can get an insights into kind of my work modes. I excel at wonder and enablement, the ideation, the support piece of it. And some of my frustrations comes from trying to galvanize and you know um, procure and, and rally the, the folks around that the idea and, and sometimes it's the tenacity, uh, the last bit that kind of sometimes um, get me. And my work, um, as I mentioned earlier, now is kind of centers around using data and leveraging data to kind of, um, you know, um, uh, uh, showcase um, operational excellence opportunities and that um, in turn kind of, you know, drive performance and across, across organizations. I think that was more than enough about me. Uh, we'll get into a bit of uh, history um, um, now. And, and apologies, I see lots of questions. I, uh, I, I promise we'll get to them at the end. And maybe my colleagues at the Founder Institute could help me if there are you know, questions or two or there's something burning that I need to stop and answer. Uh, but I'll, um, I'll go on with this and we'll come back to, to the questions. So without going into lots of details, uh, OKRs, an OKR framework, objective and key results. Apologies if I haven't kind of spelled out the acronym at the beginning. You, you Sometimes you live in the thing, you don't realize most people have no idea what you're talking about. And we have tons of acronym in our space. Um, so it's not new. Uh, roots of it goes back at least seven years. Uh, Peter Drucker kind of mentioned management by objective in, in some of his early book. He's considered, you know, one of the authorities on, on mass management and business management. Andrew Grove, who was kind of, you know, uh, one of the people who invested early at, at Intel. Um, and um, sorry, he was one of the folks that worked at Intel, um, adopted that and kind of, you know, based the OKR on the management by objective. And the idea is basically to have goals and you try to achieve them and you try to measure how close you're getting to that. It's really started getting some grounds and popularity when John Doerr, who was 
Andrew's colleague at Intel, he invested in Google in the early days and he brought OKR to Google. And then fast forward 10 years, Google was actually kind of, you know, um, um, sharing that with everyone. Uh, they had videos about it. They were talking about how it revolutionized the business. It kind of, you know, made them um, who they are right now. And now tons of companies uh, around the world, different scales of different capabilities adopt OKRs. Uh, there, are, there are multiple, lots of tools, and we'll share some of them at the end. Um, you know, uh, that helps you start, uh, excel, improve, and even kind of get very specific results and outcomes from it now. So again, the summary is not new, built, built on lots of basics from early on. And again, we, we got to OKR from management by objective. We're using smart objectives when we're talking about objectives. I mean, the goals has to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. All of that for it to be, to be um, helpful. Uh, then we use some elements of KPIs, key performance indicators. Well, one, some of your goals could be to improve on a certain KPI that you have, whether it's a revenue target or whether it's you know engagement metric or something like that. So things started to kind of you know come together in uh, uh, under OKR. And obviously, you could use OKR for balanced scorecards. Uh, again, that was um, that was a framework that's been used mostly by top management boards with leadership to kind of see what we're, we're doing in maybe four um, key um, uh, quadrants and things like that. So this is really how it all evolved. But um, I hope that was enough history to tell you that, again, OKR is not a fad. It's not a new thing. It is built on other framework. That's kind of the evolution of the goal setting framework. But what is really OKR? Uh, let's talk about that for a second. OKR stands for objectives and key results, as I mentioned. And again, it makes you think about it only has two elements. But actually, the key, this is when namings are not as good uh, in, 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 in our work. Um, it, actually, its main elements are three. You have the objectives, the results, but also the initiatives. This is where all the planning and the actual work is being done to deliver, to get to the results and to deliver uh, on the objectives. Um, the objectives tells you where you want to go, whether it's building something new or innovating um, you know, uh, in, an, in, in an industry or in a space. And sometimes it could be improving on or fixing something that you already have. And the results help you help you kind of you know um, measure where uh, the progress towards that objective, measure where you are now on your journey to kind of achieve that objective. And the initiatives, again, as I mentioned, is everything that you do, whether it's planning, work pieces, the teamwork, everything to achieve that results and get closer to your objectives. How does it fit within uh, the traditional? mission, vision, strategy, you know, all these things that you hear about. So obviously up top, we have the vision. Why does this company exist? What do we want to do uh, really? And this is becomes the mission, the approach that we take, whether it's, you know, we, we exist in this space because we felt consumer in a certain industry need the better solution to something, something, right? And then the mission is the approach. How are we actually doing that? And the strategy is that how can we execute on that promise? How can we get things to be actionable and fulfill that uh, mission for a startup or for a new chapter of uh, scale? -up? Then to operationalize and execute on that strategy, you need to broke it down. You need to break it down to objectives. Okay, to get to this strategy, I have multiple objectives, one for the sales team, one for the product team, or sometime even if we're still a small founding team, Maybe one for the individual contributor or for individual team members on that team to kind of get us closer to that um, strategy um, and sorry, get us closer to achieving uh, that, deliver on the strategy and, and get us closer to uh, uh, delivering on our uh, mission and vision. And as I mentioned, the results are just measure points and uh, you know, along the way that specify the objective that you want to or the goal that you want to hit to get there. So again, objectives are 
most of the time a qualitative statement. I want to be, uh, we want to be the best um, company in a certain space or delivering a certain product. It's usually not a quantitative space. It is an aspirational. It is sometimes what we want to improve or what we want to create. The results, when the kind of, you know, rubber meets the road, it has to be specific. It has to be quantitative. It has to be measurable. And again, this is how you measure how you're close or how you're progressing towards that uh, goal. Uh, the the template that we have is that the success of, is, is, of an objective is actually measured by the progress made on the key results. Um, and this is how sometimes how you would test if you put down a good OKR it treats this way. And I want to give you um, some examples um, after some you know that kind of theoretical part about it. So let's take a product um, or a customer discovery example. Early stage, we're all focused on the product, right? We want to research early stage customer expectation, and uh, you know, so we can improve on the areas that matter. Uh, we really want to understand what our customers want at that stage. So what do we need to do? We commit to um, X number of interviews. We commit to X number of um, summarizing learnings from that interviews. I've used that exact OKR very recently on a product that we're working on. Um, and then we commit to analyzing these learnings to come up with the top three areas that we start working on in terms of benefits and features and things like that. So that's an example of a product or early stage of customer discovery. <clears throat> Uh, let's look at the revenue uh, objective, for example. You want to expand uh, the portfolio or expand the pipeline and drive revenue growth. Again, aspirational, not quantifiable, but it tells you a direction where you want to go. Then we can distill it down to, okay, how many new clients do I need? Um, how many, you know, how much revenue do I need to increase from existing or from new clients, right? Uh, what about satisfaction or engagement? Uh, how can we measure that? What percentages are we targeting? And again, if we measure on all these three dimensions, which are the key results, and you can say 19 out of the 20 or 4 out of percent of the 15, then it gets you that, okay, given all of these inputs, you're 73% or three quarters away on your, um, on your um, kind of you know, track to hit that objective. I just wanted to give you an, a similar example on an area that's not too far from what we just talked. So someone is looking again at the maximizing revenue from current customers. So very similar objectives to what we just had before, but the way, apologies, but the way they articulate their key results tell you that things can be measured differently. And this is where key results are important is that we could have similar objectives, but we're looking at it differently or more, we're measuring progress differently depending on the objective. So again, in the previous examples, we focused on revenue from existing or number of new clients. Now we're focusing on subscription, raising prices, for example, on a certain product or retention rate instead of engagement. Or, you know, um, again, another engagement, talking to existing customer, 40% of them. To, to know more and what on, on what we could offer uh, better. So again, same objectives, different key results, and they're all um, aligned. It's it's how, actually how you try to measure it. Uh, some of our folks that are um, into the marketing and social and, and size of things, you could look at social media engagement, for example, across channels to try to maybe shore up some resources or try to, inv to decide on where to invest your time and energy, for example on the challenges. So the click-through rates, the LinkedIn posts, um, webinars, for example, things like that. So you could measure things, uh, the concrete steps to get to, to get you to a goal that, that is a bit, um, you know, that is aspirational or that's a bit unquantifiable. Like we want to increase our presence in social media. We can come up with, um, you know, clear steps or clear measures of progress. Um, I'll, uh, I'll tell you more about the benefits of a framework uh, now that we've kind of went through what are some of the basics, what is an objective, what's a KR, what are some of the characteristics of it. 
But if you're trying to work with the team or work within your organization on getting folks to appreciate the, you know, um, the benefits of having a goal setting framework like OGR, uh, why, why is it the, the go-to framework? Why is it important? Uh, when with new framework, you're creating more results oriented and data driven management styles. You want people to be informed. You want their decision making to be based on facts and evidence, uh, not gut feelings and, and not very output focused and, and on activities that we're trying to do. So you stay focused on what's important. You agree on what objectives you want to achieve this quarter or this year and how you would measure it. You actually connect in a line across the company or across the team on what is important to you. So again, we talked about similar, sorry, different objectives, but measured similar objectives, but dif different uh, measured differently. Apologies. Uh, so when you agree on a way to measure success towards that, this is alignment. This is connection across the different um, teams. You want to track for accountability and transparency. Some of the most successful uh, implementations that I've seen OKR where actually the tracking is available to everyone on the team, available to everyone in the organization so that you can easily see what we're doing on sales, what we're doing in operation, on product, even our shared services. Um, so I, I encourage you to, you know, if you think about that, have it as transparent as possible and you actually look for it to be also a measure of accountability. And at the end, doing all of that will have to drive growth and performance uh, because you're getting more actionable, you're getting more um, you know, results oriented, you're getting more uh, data driven uh, with, your, with your approaches. One of the, um, uh, again, framework is not, is not a prescription, it's not a very restrictive set of rules. So people can take different approaches and one of the, one of the areas that I get asked about a lot, and I see in, in the work that we do, is should I go with cascading or aligning OKRs? And, and we'll speak about that in a second. So cascading OKRs basically is that as a company or as you know, a founding team, we'll set on an objective and we'll try to break it down to key results. And then let's say a product team will take one of the key results and that becomes their objective. And then they will break it down further to another key results. And it goes on and on depending on how steep is, you know, the hierarchy or the, or the team and, and how wide is the organization. So again, basically you, the, your, the, the, the higher levels results becomes your objective and you keep breaking it down and cascading it down. Uh, that really works better for more established organizations with more resources that are very um, set on this strategy. It's been tested, it works, and I'll tell you more about that um, in a bit. Um, I'll tell you first about the problem model. Uh, again, very top-down um, um, uh, uh, style and, and in terms of execution, it's also very waterfall again, to mimic the development um, you know, practice that we have. It, um, it assumes that strategy is perfect or near perfect, or the company or the organization is very established that it has been tried and tested this in the past. And that basically we should all align, or sorry, we should all be cascading or working on our piece that's related to that objective. It's difficult to maintain and it gets expensive because you know, in order to answer a first question, you have to go all the way down to see, um, you know, what um, what the what the PR team is working on EU influencers, for example, to answer that question, what we're doing on launching European markets or different markets, for example. So again, it speaks about the resources that is needed and the effort that's put in it. I do not recommend cascading for early stage. It works better as you get as you mature as an organization and work in a more established uh, framework. More people are familiar, but more people are using the framework uh, to go to set goals and, and and kind of you know measure progress. And again, apologies, I missed the last one. It leaves some teams on the sidelines. So okay, we keep cascading and breaking it down, but it's not, it doesn't 
it, it doesn't assure that every team will be involved and or bought into achieving that objective. And I'll give you an example why. A company objective might not be only delivered by its sales and marketing, for example, or product and and um, and you know business development teams. What about the shared services teams? What about you know um, um, the the tech team, the finance? Like as as big as your organization can get, it could leave some folks on the sidelines. Aligning OKRs, again, very similar, but I'll tell you the, the big difference is that we, we have the same objective as a company. We want to launch our offer in or launch a product in European market. Um, this assumes we've been based in North America or somewhere else. And again, the examples, the example talks about, you know, okay, we'll talk about sales from Europe, but also um, coverage or marketing or PR efforts or social presence in, in Europe. Um, but really the objective is not um, very, it's not the same. So I'll give you an example. Sales in this example has decided to take on the key results that 30% of new sales should come from Europe. And that became their objective. And then they defined new results. They wanted to see more salespeople in the space, more sales qualified leads from that market, right? But in, in the, the PR or the market, I don't know why they call it PR. And the marketing team, for example, decided to go a different route. It didn't take the 50% as, as its goal. It wanted to have incredible brand recognition. Again, aspirational, talks about the vision or, you know, an objective that's not measurable. And we, the, they said, okay, to do that, we want to secure press releases or articles, and then we want to increase our influencers or a social uh, presence there. What about some of the support teams? For example, the folks that are working on documentation or working on manual. Uh, they are aligning to the company objective, but in a different way. They wanted to make sure that our help docs, our manuals are actually caters to the European market. Talk about different languages, different culture and locality and things like that. And again, finance, uh, if that's, you know, a product um, that you'll be selling, what about payments and what about, you know, um, uh, purchase order and things like that and set it up in a way to works for different markets or for a different industry to where you're working on. So again, aligning works better when it's really, um, when, when the teams are connecting to the main objective, they're aligning the team level objective to the company level, but they also work on their own. They believe that there are other goals or other things that they need to achieve to align with the with the main objective other than just the immediate results. And that's here, it says, you know, we're talking about, in the case of cascading, everything connects up, you know, one level up to the other, up to the other, up to the, you know, the highest one. But aligning mean basically means that we're respecting the main objective. We're aligning with the main objective, but the teams are free and actually flexible to have their own goals. They are the knowledgeable folks, so the product could look into, you know, uh, product ops team could look into having manuals or, you know, offerings in another languages or locales things. So they might start to come up with their objective to support that, to align with that, but it's not exactly the same. And I'm sure we'll get to some questions around that. It's it's a subtle difference, but it actually helps. Uh, it gives you a sense of uh, scale um, to the you know the, the this example to where you could use that. Uh, it also um, you know includes all the team when you go about aligning objective, or it includes all the members, especially at an early stage in a founding team, uh, when you talk about aligning objectives. And maybe we'll switch now to how to write a good OKR, uh, an objective and the results. And there are tools and software that helps you with that, but I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly give an overview of the basics. So we talked about the objective. Uh, what is it that we want to improve? Or what is it that we want to build? There are new objectives for new builds and there are objectives for fixes and improvements as, as you would imagine. And, and why is it important to us now, to us as a team or to us as a company or a startup or, or a founding team? And then the results are basically answers the question, how do we know if we're improving? 
and what are we actually measuring on an ongoing basis? And and the idea is that um, I've, I've shared that kind of template in the past is that you could swap the objective and the key results here and we'd be able to say, we will launch this product in the European market as measured by X, Y, Z. You have X sales from Europe or you have X uh, you know, presence or X new features that are catering to that market or that new industry. So you could test it, you could articulate it this way. And one of the things that uh, that is helpful is that, again, looking at maybe bigger or more mature organization is that the objectives are usually set as a high level, as a company level, as a corporate level. And then you get the teams to decide or their own team level and then their key results. So usually the company or the corporates, they don't have results of their own. They work the, with the team level objectives and their results as an indication of measure. So I'll give you an example that we use at Communitech. Uh, we work on dimensions or priorities that are capital, talent, you know, a community um, of, of, uh, of tech or community of entrepreneurs. These are our new, uh, our main pillars. These are objectives. We have an objective to do in every one of these areas, but the measuring, um, the results that we measure, it's actually distilled down in every team. So the marketing does their part, the data does their part, the operation, the founder services, finance, all of that. And this is healthy so that you're not bogged down with too many layers and too many redundancies. <clears throat> so again, a company should be high level, objective, uh, an improvement area or an build area that different teams or different individuals on the same team can contribute to. It's not a task that someone can do. Then um, it's not the daily work or not a project that we um, kind of um, can, can, can plan and, and achieve. It should be broad enough uh, that it can, you can brainstorm around it you can plan your work around it yet somehow specific enough to provide some direction for the quarter you're setting it in so again when we say we want to provide a superior experience for our founders in the waterloo toronto corridor for example that's one of our objectives then we get into the details what does experience mean what does engagement mean what is the delivery on that promise should should like so it is aspirational, but we can get into the specifics as well, and we can break it down into things that we get quarterly. Um, and then that's the that's the company, the corporate one. When we look at team objectives, you want to make sure that they're aligned with that. It's not exactly the same. It's aligned as in sales has their part, product development has their part, marketing has their part, finance. Uh, and again, I'm using teams in 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 in, in more established organization as an example, uh, but again, it it could very much be a small founding team at an early stage startups, and every individual kind of you know um, 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 works as a team on their own, or you know two or three small group can be a team um, on their own. So you could look at it this way. So we want to be aligned, but it's not exactly the same. So again gives us some flexibility and freedom because we know as a team what we're working on. Um, and again, gets us some um, insights into testing out the strategy and testing out winning moves that we could try here and there. Objectives are not projects, are not initiatives, are not work. It's actually what we want to achieve. What's the outcome of all the work or all the projects that we want to do in a certain area in a certain quarter. Um, when a team kind of gets together to work on their um, OKRs, they want to, they, they should, the team should be responsible for writing together their OKRs. And there are sessions and there are tools and templates and figures to help them with that. But ideally, the big questions that you want to be answered is, they want to be answering is, you know, um, how, how do we drive, uh, you know, success or how do we drive the company success forward? from within our role, uh, what's our involvement in that? How can we create or innovate or fix something or improve something for that, for it to be successful, uh, right? What are some of the challenges or barriers that are stopping us? Maybe one of our objectives is, is to break one of them or to overcome one of them, for example. So these are usually the kind of overarching questions that you ask 
what is my role in the company success or in the startup success at that stage? What can we build that new or can we innovate existing? And then again, sometimes we fall back, okay, if everything we have is good and we just need to move forward and faster and better, then what's actually stopping us? What can we do about some of the challenges? Um, um, I just wanted to give you, uh, because we talked about corporate and team or company and team level and, and an example of um, uh, aligned goals. I think we've seen another example, but again, you could look at the company, uh, improve customer retention by making more product more sticky, for example, especially in an early stage. Sales has a role around engagement, early engagement with customers. Product has a role when it comes to improving onboarding, for example. And marketing has a role. Uh, is that you could target and you know improve um, marketing qualified leads, for example, for customers that are staying longer and they target and and kind of you know aim for that better. So again, not the same objective, but they're more aligned. They they work together to achieve a company um, goal, and every one of them would have their results. Now we'll go uh, briefly to the key results piece. So. Um, what is a key result? We talked about an objective. We want to build our reputation as an industry leading, uh, you know, software provider, a SaaS, you know, a productivity tool, something like that. Um, a good OKRs um, to look at it would be, um, okay, you're talking about reputation, you're trying to measure reputation. How many, what percentage attend your events up until the end? Not just how many events you do, which would be an activity, or how many attendees, but then how many attendees will continue or complete that, for example. Uh, you want to drive unique viewers um, to, to a website or a landing page. Again, not just build a landing page or, you know, market it or something um, it, or measure visitors. You want unique results. So if you can see a pattern, it's always trying to measure an outcome not just an activity that we do or an immediate output to it so not just event not content or again you know as in the last example not just follow up with participant but what do we actually do with that follow-up is that you want to increase participation rate you want to increase the re-invites um, from one event to the other for example when you're writing them you want something that's measurable uh, sometimes it's a delta. It's a, you're measuring a change, a value change in a KPI for from from a number to a number, from a percentage of a revenue figure, a percentage, uh, indicating how close you're getting to achieving that. Ideally, you want to look at three to five, and it's perfectly fine to have one or two or three. Again, we'll talk about how many uh, around each key results and objectives you should have, but the rule of thumb is that you never pass. Uh, five uh, because it gets it gets uh, gets difficult to maintain it's your spread you know thin uh, across the things that you're trying to measure and i know i'm repeating myself a lot but really uh, the results are not activities they're not projects they're not work that you do it's actually the outcomes of that very quickly if you look at the comparison as we would do when we're buying a new device you want the objectives to be aligned Corporate to teams, uh, initiatives and key results will not always be aligned. Some will be self-sustained and maintained within a certain group or a certain team, for example. You want <clears throat> the results to be ambitious. So if you think you can do five, put seven as a measure of, uh, of progress or measure of success. And then uh, the key is we always, there is a rule, if you keep hitting 10% or you know, you're measuring the uh, key results every quarter or every month, and it's always 100 or 80 or 110. You're not setting them ambitious enough. Again, if you're if you're measuring right, and it's always 30 percent and 50 percent, maybe there's an alignment and there's tweaking that needs to be done. But you don't want to be always kind of achieving. You want to be pushing yourself a little bit further uh, for it to work. Objectives gives you direction, and then key results works on the details of you know execution in that direction. The objective and results are high impact. Again, as in they're not immediate, they're not quick as business as usual, they're not the day-to-day -day activities. Objectives are aspirational, we're talking about that. Key results is the measurable piece. Initiatives uh, you know, are to be measurable, whether 
when we're talking about results, you're measuring outcomes. When you're talking about initiatives, we're measuring the outputs from the work that you're doing. We shouldn't measure an objective. Objective actually should be our statement, where we want to go. And the smart thing, specific time bound, um, you know, relatable, understandable. Uh, I want to focus on the last two for a second. When you're setting an objective for a team or for a company, objective has to be within a circle of influence. You might not have control around everything that you do to achieve it, or everything that you get, uh, you know, uh, and I mean total control, like 100%, but it has to be within your influence, your team your immediate you know, partners, your you know, um, cross-functional teams that you work with. But it doesn't have to be within your absolute control because again, we talked about aligning multiple goals and multiple sub-goals to achieve together a certain objective or a certain goal. Um, key results obviously within your um, sphere of, or circle of influence and same as initiatives, but what stays in, within control is the initiatives or the work itself that needs to be done to get us closer to that objective to kind of you know progress on the results that has to be within your control so if you lead product development it has to be about the product if you lead marketing it has to be marketing and then when we collaborate along with others on kind of the next level objective Uh, I'm going to skip some of the examples because we, we've shared some examples and, and I have some resources to share more, just be respectful of your time. I want to get to some of the common mistakes you want to avoid. And uh, some of the absolute basic ones, uh, think of it as your checklist. You want to start, um, always start by defining an objective for the quarter, not for six months, not for a year, not for anything that's longer than that. Because again, it gets diluted, it becomes vague, uh, measure of success doesn't become really, uh, you know, as close to reality as possible. So company can set something for a year, can set a, a, an annual objective, especially on some of the big targets, the big rocks, as, as we used to say them, launching in a new market or launching another iteration or another product or something like that. But when it comes to specific teams, quarter is the key. It's, it's good enough time span to do to start to plan to do retrospective for all of that three to five key results pair objective it's perfectly fine to have one or two or three it depends on the work that you want to achieve to do or to get closer to that objective it depends on the resources and the size of the team that you have but even if you have 100 people do not measure more than five things reality you want them ambitious but not impossible we touched on that in the past uh, results are not activities or not projects. They are the outcomes from the activities or from the work that you do. And again, we talked about time bounds. Usually, it's it could be even within the quarter. You could talk about you know six weeks, eight weeks, if it's something that can um, you know mean be more specific. Um, and and you have ideas. You plan initiative and work to achieve it. Um, it, if you look at key results and there are no work associated with it, there are no plans and no initiatives to it, it's not a good AR, a good OKR, it's not actionable KR, it's not something that you'll be able to measure. And again, the team's actually action should have a clear impact on the results and on the objective of this quarter. There has to be alignment with what the team, what the company is working on, and the goals that you set. If we keep catered to a lot of random requests that you know we get bombarded by and we're not aligning it to the actual work that we planned for, then sometimes it's not really a failure or the shortcoming of the framework. It's more of around our mode of work or mode of execution itself. I sorry I didn't respect the you know the, the order here for a second, but I'll go back to the last one which I want to spend some more about. The KPIs. Uh, key performance indicators are not results. A uh, key performance indicator is a figure percentage, a number, something that you keep track, sometimes day to day. Sometimes you have them on dashboard and you look at them weekly with the team or monthly or something. And you want to see improvement. One of your results, one of your objective is to make an improvement, to make an impact on one of the KPIs, but objectives or results are not um, the same as, as um, okay, uh, sorry, KPIs. 
Again, we mentioned where OKR stands in relation to strategy. For example, you do the work, you achieve towards the mission and vision, you define and measure the progress you know, by OKRs, and it gets you closer to delivering on your ultimate goal or the strategy um, that kind of you know deliver on your mission. KPIs are different. It maintains business as usual. It's um, it, it gives you an insight into how are we doing. And again, it 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 can stack up, it can roll up to you know feed or inform the strategy, but it doesn't usually take care of new direction, it doesn't take care of new goals. It's really focused on the business as usual. Any advancement, any big fixes will have to go through a goal setting or you know an, an initiative uh, setting. And that example I like quite a lot. It always tells you the KPI is your car dashboard, it tells you about you know the fuel, the pressure. All of that internally, your engine, your team, your health, resources, all of that. But the OKRs are more like, you know, the signposts. It tells you how are you close to that, uh, you know, location. Are you, you know, one, two, or three um, closer to that goal that you have towards the end? It's a bit external. It's a bit aspirational. You're driving towards it. You don't have a ton of control over it. Uh, but this is how you measure. Uh, yeah. Uh, again, I, I attribute lots of uh, and, and recognize lots of resources from Purdue and Week Done, and we'll give you some more resources uh, on it. Again, there are lots of open, accessible, public content out there to help you set a proper, um, you know, um, OKR framework. Um, but these are the ones that I wanted to share. Very quickly on the process itself, um, just mindful of time. Um, again, usually we talked about a quarter, and if you distill a quarter right before the end you want to close the previous one get some learning um, eventually i mean if it's the first quarter you're talking this as a team as a management team as a leadership you get together and you want to define what it is for the quarter but if it's a recurring one usually the last one is more of a retrospective a documentation of the learnings what we've done how are we do what do, what do we need to extend in the next quarter what do we need to pivot on things like that and then the first one uh, first week of the quarter you close all the okrs achieved dropped missed things like that and then throughout the quarter you want to monitor you want to track you want to intervene if there are things that um you know needs to happen but if we look within the quarter with more kind of zoomed in uh, approach you want to set an align early on you could do weekly some Larger organizations, they do monthly, but the teams do weekly. So again, depending on what stage, what size of an organization you have, sometimes you have a combination of both where the smaller teams have weekly check-ins where they are, and then they report to a, a leadership team or you know, uh, or their um, kind of leadership group on, on a monthly basis. But then everyone across the org needs to know at least once a quarter where we are. This is when we analyze, our, our performance, this we share our learnings from the past and then kind of set and plan for the next. And again, most of the tools will have something like this. This is from week done. You have an objective, you've broken down to results, you are measuring the results, whether number, percentages, um, you know, anything. And then you're measuring, um, you're working on initiatives to get you to achieve these results. And you're kind of breaking down the plans by individual, by team, right? And you want to talk about what's important this week, what is important that month, what's important this quarter, and then keep measuring that and it then rolls up. So that at the end of the quarter, um, you know, across, let's say three or five objectives, you say, this is how we've done in a very objectable, um, you know, way. Now, I want to share some resources with you and I believe we'll, we'll share these slides. So you'll have all these active links there are guides step by step. So I've given you some summaries, but there are complete guides. There are some examples. There are um, you know uh, websites that are dedicated to templates for writing goals and objectives. OKR examples, I believe it's by we done or or, or Purdue. Um, Tability also have some templates. Most of the major <clears throat> you know. Um, uh, uh, work, collaboration tools, Notion, Mirror, all of these, they have templates for OKRs, um, PowerPoints, Google Sheets, all of that. 
and there are systems if you want to get sophisticated and you want to buy in. And I believe most of them, like we've done in Purdue, I believe they're free for if you're less than maybe three or five users. Um, we use Asana, for example, and it gets sophisticated as you know as you go with the tiers. So again, multiple resources, multiple systems. But if you want to focus on, and again, video and article, like different modalities so that you share the message across different teams. But some of the essentials one that you I want to share with you is a template, a planning template to come up with the actual OKR or the actual objective and results and plan the work. Uh, respecting you know resources respecting hours respecting impact and revenue or or something else for example if you're not if you're pre-revenue so that comes okr and then again you have to have a template for this and you have to have a template could be even a spreadsheet to put your key results in a place aligned to your objective and be able to measure it per quarter so if you if you don't want to use any of this or you're not at a stage to go like full implementation mode on it at least use some template to help you with the planning and use a template to keep track of it and again i mentioned in this there are lots of resources here um, to help you with this including some links to the templates there are even remember the readable part i will objective measured by um there are tools and, and i believe they're free on, on we've done to help you make sure that OKR is good, objective is good, key results good, it's readable, it's measurable if it's a key result, and it gives you a score, like good needs improvement, something like that. I use it, I use the example, so don't shy away, use the tools. Um, and again, thank you very much. I think, uh, I hope it was helpful to kind of go through this. Apologies if I went um, over uh, time, and I'm happy to take some questions or answer some questions um, now. I mean, thank you so much. Uh, I I hope you can see the emojis on your screen. The folks obviously loved it. You're getting I started of... seeing them right now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, a ton of applause, a ton of hearts. Yeah. Thank you so much for that very, very in-depth um, presentation. And folks, uh, don't worry. We will send you the presentation along with the recording of the video in 48 hours. Uh, I do want to be very mindful of the time here because we're right about to end. So I'm just going to take a question or two right uh to start things off um this isn't a question we got in the in our question panel but generally is something that's been discussed in the chat uh assume that i am a solo founder uh, my goal now is to look for a co-founder you know do customer research is it too early for me to really be thinking about okrs and frameworks or should i you know just be really in the trenches and focusing on um you know the bare minimum basics it's an excellent question and and again the answer is easy it's never too early even if it's something as finding a co-founder that could be an objective the idea is that you don't want it's a mindset you don't want to always think about finding an objective you want to set some steps that are actionable that you can measure so that if you even if you don't find a uh, a co-founder in a term or a time frame that you set for yourself or for the or for the company or the team, at least you see for yourself as a founder how close you are to getting that. So you can set number of you know events, community events that you get to, X number of co-founder potential that you talk to, you know, even set for yourself a list of items that you want to discuss with future candidates that you know you want to do and do that validation for you. So again, I, I wouldn't recommend going and buying an OKR or like subscribing to an OKR platform at that stage. But as a mindset, as a framework, again, that's the beauty of it. It's not that restrictive. You can even have the basics. Just a jot down in a note on your phone. Like this is my objective, finding a co-founder in this place or with that experience in a certain time frame, and maybe a couple of um, uh, metrics underneath, a couple of results to tell you how close you are from that. And again, you can get as sophisticated as in, in the journey or as you grow from there. But um, again, I want to stress, it's never too early. It's a mindset. It's a framework. You want to be conscious. You want to be mindful about the goals and achieving them. Awesome. Yeah. And just to follow up on that, how do I determine if my goal is significant enough to be an objective, right? Excellent. Yeah. So again, 
it, it it's a muscle that you have to train. Again, um, in, with these things, most of the guides will tell you everything will need sometimes, and they always come in 18. Could be 18 weeks, 18 months, 18, you know, something like that. You do the be- you do your best on trying to abide by the practices. Let's say objective is aspirational, uh, something that I can achieve or measure at least in a quarter, right? So that I'm not wasting six months or nine months without or not being able to know if I will ever achieve that or if this is too small or too you know far fetched or something like that. So you really put a few of these to test, and again, you want something that is. Inspirational, but achievable. It's not prohibitive and time bound so that you give yourself a test time to see how close. And again, if it happened, great, we will measure it. If not, then at least we learn from it and we set something differently the next cycle. Um, But I think you could use some of the tips that we shared today. And if I would pick just the basics is that time box it and be as aspirational but also respectful of your resources and effort and time. Awesome. Thank you so much for that answer. So what I want to do is I want to bring this question up on stage because I feel like it's pretty interesting and this might speak to uh, maybe like the benefits of the OKR framework. So Shivani here asks, for my business, very early stage, uh, I am using user stories and tasks. I've created an organization using Azure DevOps. Should I switch to OKRs? Are they complementary to user stories? And just to kind of add to this question, a ton of our um, uh, audience, they've been wondering, can they maybe combine frameworks? Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Great question, Giovanni. Uh, Again, I would not recommend switching to, again, OKR is a framework for goal settings. It is not a tool to understand your customers, your, you know, users, user journeys, user personas, user stories are very good at that. You have the canvases, you have the models. What OKR can do for you is measure the progress on that understanding or measure the progress on achieving that intimate, uh, you know, understanding of your customer or your user so that you can set, you can break down your goals. Again, I'll do interviews, I'll get uh, X personas developed within a certain time frame. So definitely complement, but not replace. And again, there are things that are still will be timeless. The, 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 the canvases, you know, the business model canvas, all of that. And different audience will, you know, talking to investors, they, they might not want to see your OKRs, but they will be very, you know, impressed that you're thinking about goal setting and measuring at an early stage. But you might want to show them a user persona or a story in a deck or something like that. So it's all complementary. And, and again, you know, you know your resources, you know your time, you know your team. So be mindful of not overburdening or over-indexing. That's why, again, Daniel, first question. Like, if you're in early stage, don't go full force, 100, you know, NPA. Like, don't subscribe and set up an organizational framework and all of that. But at least start thinking about the framework from that. What is my goal? How am I get closer to it? Same with the, with the user stories example. Awesome. There you have it, folks. So start thinking about it, even if you're not fully implementing it. Uh, Emma, thank you so much for taking out the time to join us. I just kind of want to remind you that we're kind of past uh, the hour mark. So yeah, Emma, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. I enjoyed this. I hope it was helpful. And again, um, you know, I've seen you sharing. We'll share the slides. We'll share the resources. I'm more than happy to folks uh, for folks to reach out on LinkedIn, answer some, you know, short code, quick questions if if I can uh, do that. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so, folks, we'll have Ahmed's uh, LinkedIn uh, shared with you in our follow up email as well, or you can, uh, you know, head on over to your LinkedIn, look him up. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and please be mindful we do have the networking happening right after this. Join the table, talk to a fellow founder, talk to an aspiring startup founder or maybe the FI team. Uh, So we'll see you in the next one. Have a great day, guys.